Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Okay, so this morning we are going to be uh, looking at God's provision and protection and um, the title I decided to give it this uh, this morning is When Did You Last Eat? Um, you will see as we get further on where I am going to be going with this. There is a certain noise that those of us, especially here in the Northeast, are very accustomed to. You can be sitting in your house. You can have the windows closed. You can have the curtains drawn in the winter. And when you hear this noise, you know exactly what it is. It is where somebody, say, has uh, gotten themselves stuck in a snowbank. And what's underneath that snowbank? Ice. That classic sound of rubber tires just spinning on ice, getting no traction whatsoever. Now, if you go out and say to help this person, whether you know them or not, you know, it might take a little bit of shoveling, maybe putting some sand or salt down, and then they're on their way. It's typically, uh, for those small little uh, mishaps, it's typically not too hard to get out of that situation. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort usually. Maybe a little bit of extra pushing on their back bumper or something, but they're able to get out of it. Well, this morning we are going to be, I'm going to be talking to those of, uh, to those of us who maybe are kind of in that same boat, but in our spiritual lives. It just seems like we are, our tires are just spinning. Uh, we are just going through the motions in our lives. We are, uh, maybe at one point you were uh, on the mountaintop in your Christian life, whether that was, um, say, something fairly recent, maybe it was just that, uh, that great, wonderful experience that Jesus talked about in John um, when he was talking to Nicodemus about that second birth. Maybe that was the last time you really had that high point in your Christian life, that point when everything seemed grand, everything seemed great, everything that you looked at, everything that you, uh, anything you did, you were just praising God about it, thanking God for it, um, any sort of small thing that happened to come your way, it was just so easy to just say, God, Thank you so much, but I need your help right now. But then maybe uh, over the years, um, certain things have happened, whether it's just a lot of small blows, or maybe um, or maybe you had something, a large um, blow come at you, but something uh, really knocked you down. And you are just at that point where you're just spinning your tires. You are a stuck soul at that point. And you just can't seem to get out on your own. You need help out. And maybe that help out at this point isn't um, a fellow Christian. It is that point where 
Um, you need that big old tow truck to come and pull you out. And in this case, obviously, that tow truck I'm talking about would be God. Something that only God can do. Something that only God can handle. The first verse I want to uh, pull up and look at this morning is Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. This is part of the Beatitudes. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So, when you're looking at this, well, if I want to be blessed. Now, when we look at the word blessed, obviously we think, okay, everything is great. Good things are coming to me. And yes, you are correct in that sense. So looking at this, okay, everything's going to be good, at least for a short time, or I'm going to get a blessing. If I am hungry and thirsty, okay, well, you know what, I just worked a hard day. Yeah, I just, I'm going to use an extra long day at work. I'm starving. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm not talking about that that great dinner you might go to at home of uh, uh, maybe steak and potatoes finished off with a piece of pie or something. Or an upside down hamburger. <laughs> yeah. You won't find me eating that one, Wally. I guess I set myself up for that one, didn't I? Yeah. Um, and uh, this here, this hunger, this thirst that is talked about here, um, is also not that passive hunger or thirst. As in, if somebody goes and says to you, a friend approaches you and uh, and uh, asks you, you know, hey, you want to go out for a bite to eat? You're not particularly hungry. You're not famished. You're just like, oh, I could eat. That's not what we're talking about here. This hunger, this thirst that is being talked about here is that one, a good picture that works for me. Growing up, um, you know, the Saturday morning cartoons and that, uh, you would see once in a while this picture of a guy out in the desert just crawling along on his belly. Water! Water! He just can't survive. He's, a, he's about ready to give up. No strength left. That's all he's focused on is that water. That is this hunger, this thirst that is talked about here. Where it is our whole being. It is out of desperation. That is all that we are focused on, is that hunger and that thirst, in this case, after righteousness. Everyone has, a, uh, has this deep longing in them. When I mean everyone, I mean everyone. Every human being ever has a deep longing in them. And many tend to go to the wrong places to try and fill that longing, that hunger. They don't know what it is. They're just like, I, there's something in me. I need something. Maybe they go to alcohol. Maybe they go to drugs. There are many different ways. Gambling. I mean, the list is endless of what people could go into trying to fill that void in their life. And one thing that can be a hindrance, and Hollywood has gotten this very good, been very, gotten very good at this, is uh, the average TV show is um, roughly, for the 30 minute segment, is actually 20, 22 minutes long. In that 22 minutes, you have a horrible problem, and then within 20 minutes later, <clears throat> everything is beautiful, everything is fine, everything is fixed, uh, there's no problems in the world. Well, that has gotten our minds into this habit, into this mindset of thinking that, oh, you know what? This is, no matter what the problem is, it is going to get resolved fast. It is going to be very easy to overcome when I can tell you just from my own experience, that's not always the case. Have you... Maybe in your walk this morning, have you been knocked down? You are at that point where you just don't know where to go. 
you don't know what, maybe you don't even know what's going on. You are just, everything seems to be coming at you from every which direction. You're, you're just at the point of throwing your hands up. I, I don't know. I don't even know what's going on. Well, I want to show you first somebody that had a, uh, um, had a deep longing, but searched for it in the wrong place. Fairly familiar story or account. Let's go to John chapter 4, please. Starting first in uh, verse 7, we are talking about the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, when Jesus' disciples went off to find him food, he went to this well in Samaria because, of course, being God, he knew there was somebody going to be there who had this deep longing, but just couldn't figure out where to or how to fill this longing. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now, of course, that's a simple thing. I mean, how often do we um, say expect that? You know, we go out to um, a restaurant, of course, now, typically, um, they are, uh, you know, they might ask you what you want to drink. Um, but that's what we're sort of expecting. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm here. That's one of the things they serve. So this is a well with water that you drink. So it seems like a normal question. But this Sumerian woman, this Samaritan woman, didn't just, oh, hi, mister. Yeah, sure. Here, here here's some water. Drink up. Her reaction was, what are you talking to me for? I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jew. We don't talk to each other. It just, it, it isn't done. Without going into the whole background of the story, that's not what we're focusing on this morning as to why that was, um, there is a, um, uh, Jesus goes on in talking with her. And uh, give me the next section of John chapter, uh, John there please, the next section of verses. Uh, starting in verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now remember, so at this point, Jesus has, uh, uh, Jesus is going into and telling her, you know what, there's two types of water here. There's the water that you can offer, and that's what he's talking about in verse 13. Sorry, Shane, can I have 13 back real quick? Um, whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. He's saying, your water is good, but you know what? It's hot up here. Give it a little bit, and I'm going to be thirsty again. Uh, let's go on to 14 now, please. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. <clears throat> but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Uh, let's just keep going. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. Now this is where we see that Jesus truly was God. He has never met this woman before. This woman doesn't know Jesus in the sense of she knows he's a Jew. But that's, but that's it at this point, that she really knows about him other than this stranger, this Jew, who shouldn't be talking to her, is offering up water that can somehow make it to her that she never has to lower that bucket into the well again. Otherwise, that's all she knows. And yet, what is he uh, He's saying? Oh, go to your husband. Let's read on further. Jesus saith unto so the uh, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said when you said I have no husband. Yeah, that's correct. You don't have a husband. In fact, you have had five husbands, and the guy in, in he whom thou hast now is not thy husband, and that thou sense that sense thou truly. He said, Yeah, not only do you not have a husband to bring me right now, you've had five past husbands. And the one you're with, the guy you're with currently, he is not your husband. So yes, you are correct. I mean, imagine if you were that woman going, whoa, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's the, a lot of people up in the town there, they, they know me, but you, 
you're a Jew, you've never been here. How could you possibly know that? I mean, it's at this point um, that, of course, she sort of, she puts the two, two together and see, but, and figures out exactly who he is and everything. But this is a good example of someone that has gone looking in the wrong place to fill that deep longing. Ignoring our call in, uh, uh, in life, uh, just with being a Christian and what we have been commanded to do, um, see if I remember how to pronounce this, asadia, I believe is how it's pronounced. It is a Latin word. It is actually one of the seven, uh, what we call deadly sins. And that is slothfulness. The seven being pride, envy, wrath, gluttony, lust, greed, and of course then there's sloth or slothfulness. Now of course, the reason why I said slothfulness first is if you were to ask me or my kids, you say sloth, the first thing you think of is that cute little furry animal that just <coughs> hangs from a tree all day and sleeps all day. And now that's not what we're talking about this morning. No cute little animals here this morning. This um, acidia is in fact a retreat to mediocrity after commitment. It is where you have been at that high point in your life. You may have even gone so far as even beyond um, having given that gift of salvation. You have gone to that point where you have committed your life to God. And maybe you did serve for years. But now, whether no matter what it is that happened, you just settle back to the mediocrity. You're just spinning your tires. You're just going through the motions. Maybe even you're just coming to church out of habit. You've just done it for so long. That's just what you do Sunday mornings. It's not. It may not even be a thing of where you're doing it on purpose to make it look good to other people. Maybe that's just what you do. That's why you're here. A, um, oh, I forgot to write his name down. I had his name here. Um, there was a uh, pastor that uh, gave this a uh, little bit more explanation on this slothfulness or acedia. Acedia specifically is a gray morning's inclination not to intensify the original yes to God, community, or spouse, that that yes seems to threaten individuals with a negation of all their potentiality and to promise a lifetime of misery. They choose, therefore, to swim no further. What they really opt for is some measure of control over their own comfort in front of the incalculable risk of relatedness not wanting to push any further upstream, and not wanting to lose face by turning back altogether. The victims of acedia tread water, as it were, and either console their anxieties with sleep, or attempt to dissipate them in one distraction after another. This is where you are maintaining appearance but you are sacrificing substance. Now in the, um, in the first, in what we read for uh, opening scripture this morning, um, I'm just gonna pick out a few things here. This might be hard for you to pull up, Shane, so if you're not able to pull them up, um, that's fine. I'm not sure how it was in there this morning. Um, but in Psalms chapter 91, we have some, uh, uh, some good examples of, say, bad things that we might see as a Christian. And that's, uh, we might see the snare of a fowler. Um, we might see some noisome pestilence. Uh, let's see, what are some others? Uh, we might be, uh, we might have terror uh, by night or arrows flying by the day. Pestilence that walks in darkness. Destruction that walked, uh, wasted at noonday. 
Uh, verse 7 says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But the great thing about the Bible, and I know that's why it is pastor's favorite word, this Bible is full of that three-letter word. But, even though you are going through these hard times, and it's saying it's going to happen as a Christian, what does it say after it's saying everyone else may be uh, falling around you? What does it say? It will not come nigh to me. Now, that does not mean that we are going to have um, this wonderful, easy life where nothing goes wrong. Another familiar account that we have in the Bible. This time of a man named Job. He was an upright man. He believed in God. He worshipped God. Him and his whole house. Every, he just seemed like everything was going great for him. Strong Christian man. Well, it came time where uh, uh, the sons, uh, the sons of men, and th in this case, it's talking about angels. We're going to, re we'll call it this. This picture is given us as angels say are reporting back to God, and well, Satan comes along too to God. And just and this is we'll give you the name crane version. The uh, God says Satan. What's the matter with you? You look disturbed more than normal. What's going on? Satan's just, God, I get bored. Nothing is a challenge anymore. <clears throat> yeah, you've got Christians, you've got people believing in you. It's just, I don't know, there's just something about it. I'm just bored. And what does God do? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, see, I got all these. Christians rooting for me, they're worshiping me, ha <laughs> ha. No. He goes, Have you considered my servant Job? When we think of a somebody that's a uh, a protector, a provider, we are not going to be thinking that this person is just going to when you know something bad is going to happen, because I mean God's talking to Satan, okay? Good things don't come from Satan. Excuse me. Um, you think, uh, sorry. Good things do not come from Satan. So why is he offering up this guy who it says is this great, strong Christian that serves him and is loyal to him? Well, he does. He says, have you considered my servant Job? And then he goes in as he's talking to uh, to Satan. I mean, and Satan goes, uh, "Well, you know what? You think God? You think He's great? But you know what? Come on, it's me. I can take down this guy. I can make him question his faith. I can do this." And uh, at this point, to give you a visual picture, an easy way to to look at this is say up until this point God had a protective hedge around Job and that's why it just seemed like he was thriving well he seemed like he was he was a very rich and wealthy man um, but God at that point he's like well you know what I'm going to raise that hedge around all his stuff but you're not allowed to touch him you know put that hedge back around just Job do whatever you want I believe he will stay, uh, or no, he will stay faithful to me. You can just imagine saying, ha, ha, yes, I am going to go knock God down a peg or two when he sees that this guy, Job, isn't all that he thinks he is. He goes, and first thing that happens to Job, um, he, had, he loses all of his livestock. <clears throat> he loses uh, all, all of his earthly belongings. He loses his family, all but his wife. Um, <clears throat> loses everything. <clears throat> and it's at this point that many, uh, many people, even Christians along, losing everything. What is, if you are not real, uh, strong Christian, if you're not really 
uh, say devout to God, it's very easy at that point to shake your fist at God. I thought you loved me. Why are you doing this to me? Well, let's see what Job's uh, reaction is here. Um, God, uh, Job's response to God. Uh, Job chapter 1, please. Those verses. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and cried, Boo-hoo, woe is me. No. He did go through those points of mourning. He just lost all his kids. So that's normal in that sense. What does it say he did? The first thing he did, he worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've got one more verse there. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He said, you know what? I came into this world without a penny. I came with, with nothing at all. Well, if this is the time, God, if I've done everything for you, you're done with me, I'm all yours. Go ahead and take me. And not only, you know, it says in this verse, not only did Job, you know, Job sin not, he, they, I love the fact they make sure to put in this last part, nor charged God foolishly. He did not once even think or even have the thought in his head of, God, why did you do this to me? Why is uh, why is this going on? I thought you loved me. He didn't even think it. And then it go. We know the story goes on. Um, the next thing that we see is that uh, Satan goes back to God and says, "Well, it didn't work." God's like, "Oh, I knew it would." And uh, Satan's like, "But." I know how I can knock him down. Before, you wouldn't let me touch him. <coughs> let me touch him. I guarantee you, if I do something to his health, yeah. I can pull him down. And God said, okay, give it a try. My one rule, you can't kill him. So, he got uh, Satan made Job get boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. So bad that it says he took a pot, sir. Took a, essentially a chunk of a clay pot just to scrape dead skin and all that off. Just to try and get it saved to dry out and to, um, uh, to get a little bit of relief from it. It was so horrible. And this woman, this lovely woman who is supposed to be a helpmeet, that is supposed to support him thoroughly and throughly. What does she say? Curse God. Oh, why don't you just curse God and die? Let's, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, I wasn't sure if I had this uh, verse in there. Right here you can see. His wife said to him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Really? Everything that God is allowing you to go through, what He's taken from you, you're still, you're still retaining your integrity. Oh, just curse God and die. Now going on, Job's uh, answer. But he said to her, "Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh." First of all, I got to ask to the husbands in here: How many of you in here, to your wife's face, will call her foolish? You notice I'm not putting my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all of this did not Job sin with his lips. He's saying, you really expect that it's going to be nothing but a perfect life? We're going to have evil. We're going to have hard times, too. <clears throat> and all throughout the book of Job, we see also these three wonderful friends that he has. 
who do nothing but do the same thing that his wife is doing. But they go, instead of just coming right out and saying in a simple thing, oh, this curse God died, like his wife said, they just go on and on and on, trying to convince him, break him down. Well, to a little bit, they are uh, successful. They're able to pull him down as a Christian a little bit to the point where he does start questioning God a little bit. He's not cursing God or anything like that, but he is gotten to he has gotten to the point where he's just like, God, everybody I know I either lost or they have turned on me. All these people that are supposed to be close to me, I thought they loved me, they're turning on me. God, what is going on here? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? Next we see what God's answer to Job is in Job chapter 38. There are two verses I'm going to look at. Excuse me. God asks Job this question. Who is that? Who is this that darkened counsel by words without knowledge? He's saying, Job, you're a godly man. You know what I have said. So at this point, the scriptures that were that were uh, um, that were written at that point, you know the scriptures. You know what's right. Why are you listening and taking counsel of words? It says by words without knowledge. You're taking counsel from people who just who don't know what they're talking about. Why are you doing this? Then verse four, please. And then God's next question, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast, if thou hast understanding. God says, Job, I have been here right along. I was here. Were, were you there when I laid the foundation? Were you there when I created the very ground you are walking on? Obviously, Job's the answer would be, well, no. <laughs> Um, I was like, I've always been there. I created you. I created everything you see. How is it that you think that you're starting to think that I'm not in control anymore? See, what was Job's problem at this point? He did not, he could not see, or he, he had no idea what God's motives were. Of course, in the end, um, the we'll call it the happy ending. Um, of this story was that uh, in the end uh, when he uh, confessed and asked forgiveness and such he uh, just to sum it all up he not only got back um, can I have that Matthew chapter 5 verse 6 again please Shane I'm going to keep Shane busy this morning um, for they shall be filled the last portion of that Job not only had everything restored to him, but multiple times over. Because of how strong he did stay, even in those hard times. We have been looking at, um, in uh, night service, on the night service, evening services on Sundays, we've been we going through the parables of Jesus. And um, one of the most famous things and popular things that we have seen with Jesus is he is always giving his disciples and Christians warnings about our enemies, about how hard it's going to get. Um, well, uh, can I have Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, please? Verses 16 through 22. Behold... I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father, which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, 
and the father of the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endure to the end <coughs> shall be saved. That just seems like all gloom and doom, doesn't it? It's just everybody is going to be fighting against each other. You can even, it says, we're just talking about uh, father and his child, brother and brother. That's saying you may even have family that turns against you shuns you because of your beliefs. Because you're a Christian, they will shun you. But the great ending to that is, he that endure to the end shall be saved. Now God has given us um, tools to be able to use in this fight that we have in life as uh, the different, uh, as enemies are hitting us for every which way. Another familiar portion here, Ephesians chapter 6, please. Of course, we are talking about here the armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins spirit about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the gospel, with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking that shield of faith, wherewith she be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, so that I open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And I'm going to go that far there. We are given these tools. Many are for protection. These two here are for the offense. And at first, when you think of a shield, you think, oh, shield, to protect me. Yes, it's protecting. But in that hand-to-hand -hand combat, that close one-to-another battle, what can this shield be used for? It can be used to hit. It is an offense. It is to get them away so then you can attack with the sword. In this battle of life. Now, first of all, we can read there in that uh, in these uh, in these scriptures here in Ephesians that all we need to do is stand. We need to stand, therefore, it says. But being as humans are, God knows us very well, He knows we're going to fight. We see this coming at us. We are going to fight. And that is why he gives us this armor. He gives us these tools of war. There is, however, one other thing that, uh, um, it's not a tool, but it's something God has uh, given to us. Give me uh, Psalm 23, verse 5, please. Of course, everybody, I think everybody in here, if you can't quote most of the 23rd Psalm, you've at least heard it. Uh, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. What is the other thing that God has given us in this battle? He's given us a table. Okay. Nate, where are you going with this? In a battle, a table, what has that got to do with anything? Well, the picture I want to give you this morning
morning is being that God has given us this armor and these tools, we know we're going to be fighting. Even if we are calling on Him to help us once in a while, it is human tendency, it is nature at this point, to we are going to try to do it on our own. So we are fighting this battle. We have this shield up. We are going with the sword. God is there with us. And that is how we have not been totally trampled at this point. But he, uh, so we are fighting, we are fighting, but we are finally getting to that point where we, they're just, it's too, they're too strong for us. We might be, down, you might be down on your knees at this point. You're not even fighting, you're trying to just shield yourself. And uh, the great picture that I'm going to give you here this morning, the picture of this table, <clears throat> is that in this battle, this fight, we all must, all at this point, it's just like, God, you cry out, I need, I can't do it. I've been foolish trying to do this on my own. God, I can't do it. Well, at that point, we have this, we can have this visual of Satan and his, uh, we'll call him his minions, coming at us, fighting us. And all of a sudden, Satan looks over. God. This is a battlefield. What is God doing setting a table in the middle of this battlefield? At that point, when you go, God, I need you, God just goes, stop. And this picture is not of, say, Satan and his minions just stopping, just Waiting, waiting there at the ready to just come at you again. It's not like they're frozen in time. Showing you that he is in complete control. And it's at this point that he says, the shield, the sword, Christian, set it down. You don't need it right now. See, I'm in control. Okay, Rosie, you ready? I was teasing her all over. It is at this point God says, Christian, come. Sit down. Take a load off. Eat. Rest. I am in control. Uh, the kids loved help setting this up, by the way, going down to all the toys, getting all the plastic food. Um, I, I can take this one while you come upside down, so I'm not actually going to eat it. I'd like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to. No, no <laughs> this picture of God's alt is Him showing us His power in this war, in this battle that we have been foolishly trying to fight on our own and our own strength, maybe once in a while calling on God for something, you know. God's just like, hey, you finally said, I need you. I want you. I've been preparing this for you. I have had this point of rest. I have had this point of blessing waiting for you. Waiting for you to say, God, I need you. Hebrews chapter 2, please. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. This is talking about when uh, <clears throat> Jesus is talking about how Jesus, showing his power, he came to earth as flesh. And blood. He came to earth as a human. Now, of course, we know he was all human, but he was still all God. Now, imagine that uh, another great picture that we can have. I I grew up reading comics a lot. I love I love pictures and books. So bear with me as I constantly say these pictures. Um, 
we have this picture where Jesus has now been beaten. He is on the cross dying. We can see down in that crowd, you see Mary and all the other people who are there. But then you can just see this, uh, you can just see this other figure there. Satan is like, come on, just die already, come on. Jesus cries, it is finished. And he dies. Imagine the party Satan had. Yes, I did it. I won. <coughs> and of course, we know, though, that his party was short-lived. On that third day, you can just see Satan say, sitting there on his little throne that he has, just thinking, ha, I conquered. I did it. One of his minions comes up, um, sir, we have a little problem. I don't want to hear about any problems. This is a joyous time. Well, about that, um, he's not dead anymore. <laughs> Imagine Satan just going, no, I thought I had it. So it is through this that Jesus has proved he's not only in control uh, of, say, um, certain aspects of our life. He is in control of literally life and death. Our very existence he is in control of. And one other thing that we have looked at in... Uh, um, in Sunday night services is how he is another picture he's given us multiple times Jesus gives his teachings when he was here on earth is how he, he's like I take care of the smallest of birds I take care of the sparrows you really think that you know all of this I can take care of but somehow I'm not able to take care of you really I mean, look at how, look at the design I did for your body. You know, it's one thing. You know, people can learn um, different things in this world, inside and out, learn everything about it. You can have somebody that can learn, say, everything about an engine. There is nothing they don't know about that engine. Okay. You know, inside and out. They can even know all the specifications for the motor. Okay, everything about it. Smallest, minute fractions of measurements, everything. And yet, tell me, how many people in this world have can claim that they have fully figured out the brain? But they have fully figured out and fully understand our nervous system. Not a one. Now they're learning more and more as the years go through and everything to help us out and not everything, but and I, I know I really don't think anybody's gonna ever be able to fully understand or figure this stuff out. God's like, I designed you in a way so magnificent you know that you're from me. I did it. No one else can do this. When we're looking back at that table, of course, as I jokingly have these different foods here, um, you know, being a guy that loves his dessert, I've got pie and cookies and chocolate and donuts here too. I make sure not to leave up a good part of dinner. As we are looking at this, we are not talking about this type of food. Going back to uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, we are talking about um, <clears throat> this, uh, this, this hunger and this desperate hunger, this desperate thirst, which is supposed to be after righteousness. What are we, we are supposed to be eating this bread that is symbolized through, that I'm symbolizing through this plastic food here, this bread. 
being the bread of life. The water that can be poured into this cup could be, <clears throat> I'm sorry, everlasting water. And you know what? It's not a thing of, you know, this holds, let's see, I'm going to take a guess, maybe half a gallon. I don't know, maybe not that much. It's not, it's not something where God says, okay, get your cup. Fill it up once, you drink it. Fill it up a second time, you go, oh, that's it, that's all I've got. Mm -hmm. Everlasting water. My cup, will, your cup will run over. We see uh, in scripture, our cup runneth over. It is there whenever we need it. It will never run out. This morning I present a question. Do we really believe what God is promising to us? God has promised us that he will take care of us. God is promising us his protection, his provision. Now remember the story of Job. It's very easy to look at that negative, but what was he doing? He was just using Job as his tool at that point to just try and knock Satan down a few more pegs. Are you willing this morning to be God's tool to say knock Satan down a few pegs if he chooses to use you? There is a, uh, a story of a... Uh, a young student and his uh, spiritual teacher. And he asks his spiritual teacher this question. Master, how do I truly find God? The master said, come down to the river here with me. So they walk down to the river. He's just like, no, no, come on out into the water with me. He goes out, you know, Fairly, fairly deep, say about chest deep in the water, standing there, and the students just like, okay, what? Well, at this point, this spiritual teacher grabs a hold by the head, shoves him underwater, and holds him there. And at first, it's just like, okay, I'm sure this student is thinking, how in the world is this going to help me find God? And uh, so he goes, and after a little bit, she's Okay, starting to get hard, so tapping the teacher, like, come on, let me up. Pretty soon, he's to that desperation. He is running out of oxygen, he is running out of air. The teacher, he's thrashing around, the teacher is forcing him to stay under. Right at that moment, <coughs> when he would have, just before he would have uh, drowned, he would have just breathed in the water, this, this master, this spiritual teacher, Let's him come up out of the water. The student says, why did you do that? And the teacher says, I was answering your question. How is that? I was trying to drown me. Answering my question. He said, your question was, uh, how do I truly find God? He said, the master says this. When you desire God, as truly as you desired to breathe air, the air you just breathed, then you shall find God. When you have that desperation, that hunger, that thirst, that's all you can think about when you have that for God and His righteousness. <coughs> now, I don't want to come across as a prosperity gospel here, saying that, oh, well, if you do this, then you're going to get this. No, you're looking at it wrong. How are you looking at it wrong? You're focusing on what you might get out of it. That's not, in which case then, that hunger is not the hunger you need to have. That hunger needs to be just simply for God. 
for his righteousness. Out of this morning, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Out of this morning's message, I just want you to um, take to heart and remember that he is there for you no matter what you are going through. This battle of life is not yours to fight Amen. alone. And this battle, there are certain times, too, where this battle, there are certain things. I mean, that I have heard people say, God will never give you anything that you can't handle. Oh, yes, he will. God will give you things that you cannot handle. Some of the things, what he'll do is he will give you the tools so you can handle it. Other times, it's just like the tools aren't working. I can't handle it. Go back to the beginning. The car is stuck, say, in a deeper ditch. You can't get it out on your own. You need that tow truck. That is when God's just like, hey, I'm right here. All you have to say is, hey, God, I need a tow. He is just waiting for you to come to him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for these promises, uh, Lord, that you have given to us, the promise of salvation. Lord, this, uh, if we just accept it, Lord, and this promise that you will, uh, uh, that you will protect us, that you will provide for us, the promise, Lord, to us that you are in control. Lord, we thank you so much for these. And Lord, this morning, if anyone is here, Lord, this morning, who uh, maybe has not accepted that first promise, that first promise, uh, that gift of salvation you're offering, Lord, I pray that this morning, Lord, they would see their need for it. They would see this, that they need you in their lives. They would see and just have that desire, Lord, that they would see that uh, maybe they are looking for this, uh, uh, <coughs> looking in the wrong places to fill that deep longing, Lord, and that they, I just pray, Lord, this morning, their hearts would be open and soften, that they would see that that spot is made for you. Well, Lord, I this morning also lift up a Christian who might be here, Lord, that might say, yeah, I've been spinning my wheels. I've been doing just that. I've just been going through the motions of life. It got hard. I couldn't handle it anymore, so I kind of just gave up. Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, for that Christian. Lord, I pray that they would see uh, this morning through these illustrations and pictures, Lord, that I gave, that, um, Lord, that uh, <coughs> they would see that you're there. You never left them. You were always there. You were just waiting for them to say, God help me. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for your many blessings. And I ask these in your name. Amen. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will 